Welcome to another video from Lockdown Electronics with me Bill and this time we've got part 5 of our series on oscillators and we're going to look at uh, two oscillators today that were commonly found in radios in the past in these days of um, synthesized signals and phase lock loops you of course don't uh, see these kind of things anymore but if you're looking at uh, old equipment or trying to do some restorations you might find this information useful so uh, both designs are over 100 years old and certainly they were very much part of the uh, amateur radio exam syllabus 40 odd years ago when I was uh, when I was about to do the exams so I remember them uh, quite vividly from that. So let's um, start with a little bit of theory of LC oscillators. LC oscillators then um, are as it says in the title involving uh, L an inductor and C a capacitor and LC oscillators use a tank circuit to control the feedback within the um, amplification section of the of the oscillator. A tank circuit being either a series uh, tuned circuit or a parallel tuned circuit and both of those um, circuits possess resonance which is uh, based on the value of the inductor and the capacitor and at resonance uh, both those circuits possess markedly different impedance so you can use them to effectively select a frequency at which uh, oscillation will occur and indeed in some radios the capacitor or even the inductor can be adjustable which would allow you to tune the oscillator so in a, a radio that would be a VFO or a variable frequency oscillator and that was how uh, valve and early transistor radios were tuned. Things of course are very different these days. Now uh, LC oscillators work well at higher frequencies and I'm talking um, in a well designed LC oscillator can certainly work up um, you know three four hundred megahertz something like that so um, we're talking um, pretty high frequencies here. Trying to use an LC oscillator at a, a lower frequency the value of the coil and the capacitor are a great deal larger and so the circuits become unwieldy and there are there are better solutions in fact we've already covered some of them um, in this oscillator series so those are the two um, circuit fragments if you like that um, that, that uh, the LC oscillator makes use of and the two that we're going to look at are uh, the Colpitts oscillator which I think it was um, I think it was Henry Colpitts invented in 1918 and Hartley, I think it was Ralph Hartley uh, invented his oscillator in 1915. Both of these uh, gentlemen were working for Western Electric at the time and I think probably the next bit that's not perhaps immediately obvious but is, is important is of course that neither Colpitts or Hartley had access to semiconductors so they were most definitely working with valves so let's have a look at um, uh, a valve LC oscillator circuit and I should at this point also say apologies to my American viewers um, great that you view the channel thank you it's appreciated forgive me for using the British term for the component a valve a valve is of course a tube and a tube is of course a valve the terms are um, interchangeable but after 50 years of tatting with electronics I can't help myself but call them valves sorry hopefully you can um, you can forgive me that one um, so um, what we've got here the valve appreciate this isn't really a video about valves but very quickly the v-shaped component at the bottom of the valve uh, warms up the uh, cathode which is the lower um, Ele electrode if you like that runs across the bottom half of the valve uh, warms it up which causes electrons to be emitted at the top of the valve the plate or anode has a strong positive charge on it and that attracts the electrons and the, the grid which is the dashed line in between depending on its um, level of charge it can control the flow of electrons that go across and so um, if that's sounding a little bit like the way a JFET works yeah you're quite right it's a very similar component now the thing just to bear in mind here is that with a valve B plus which is what that strong um, positive voltage on the plate is called in, in valve circuits could be several hundred volts certainly in the case of a, a radio you might have had in your home in the, the 40s and 50s that could have been two three hundred volts very easily so if you're going to open up the back of one of those sets be careful there's a lot of volts in there 
it also meant the capacitors had a very hard life but that's another story so the output of the valve taken from uh, the top of the anode there uh, is fed back into the lower half of the the tuned circuit on the left the tank circuit um, and eventually that output that at the top goes through another capacitor that's the capacitor to stop the um, high voltage DC from appearing on the uh, the grid which you wouldn't want um, there's a bias resistor involved for the grid as well in the same way that you see on semiconductor circuits and in that way the uh, way the um, charge on the grid varies at a frequency dependent on the tank circuit and there we get an oscillator so um, I do have some triodes but I'm not going to be faffing around with a few hundred volts on uh, a breadboard so let's go to something slightly more modern let's use a, a JFET the 2N3819 is an um, N channel JFET that's workable up to radio frequencies so here we've got a very very similar circuit it's just got a, um, a bias resistor for the for the gate of the MOSFET in the same way that there's a grid resistor for the uh, the valve circuit and the 10k resistor um, is simply to limit the current between the source and the, the drain across the MOSFET uh, and you can see that um, the output um, is fed back uh, from the um, the bottom of the MOSFET back into the into the gate so that's the general arrangement let's have a quick look at one of those on the breadboard it's incredibly straightforward apologies the two 2.2 nanofarad capacitors the only ones I'd got were actually uh, quite high voltage which is why they're so large um, but the two capacitors are the two big yellow components the 100 micro Henry inductor is the, the greenish component at the bottom there and you can see the MOSFET I've marked up source gate and drain for you there's the two the two resistors and the yellow fly lead is uh, going to the scope so that uh, we can look at the output so without further ado let's go and have a look at that on the bench here's the LC um, oscillator then with the, the JFET just here inductor there and these are the two capacitors that uh, the high voltage ones which is why they're so large as I mentioned uh, and I'm just uh, picking up uh, the signal there so let's have a look on the scope and uh, you can see it's got a very nice um, sine wave at about 500 and something kilohertz here and uh, that really is a, a particularly nice sine wave i think the um, tank circuit's doing its job rather nicely there uh, if we look at that same signal on the spectrum analyzer here uh, you can see i've got a nice uh, strong fundamental there just over 500 kilohertz and then if we look at a, a slightly wider uh, span what I'm looking for is there any harmonics because it was such a nice looking waveform I thought there can't be many spikes and as you can see uh, we've got a very strong fundamental on the left there and there are one or two peaks on there but there's nothing in particular which also suggests that that's a, uh, a nice clean output so um, JFET doing a very good job standing in for a triode there having seen how the JFET version works and you can see it works rather well before we had JFETs we had uh, bipolar transistors so let's have a look at a Colpitz oscillator um, using a bipolar transistor and I want to do this so that I can show you a, a Hartley oscillator that, and pretty much use the same circuit and hopefully you'll be able to spot the differences 40 odd years ago when I was um, uh, working towards my radio amateur exam it was a uh, one of the things you had to be able to spot was the difference between a Colpitz and a Hartley um, and actually it's relatively straightforward the Colpitz oscillator always has um, two capacitors and there is a centre tap if you like taken between the capacitors so at the collector of that transistor we've got a, um, a parallel tank circuit which consists of the 3.3 microhenry inductor and the two capacitors the 33 nano and the 10 nano um, and there's a centre tap and we've got a DC blocking resistor going between the uh, the output of the, from the emitter there going back to feed that circuit so that's how we uh, generate the, um, the feedback if you like and it is the resonance of that tune circuit that controls the frequency of the oscillation so on the breadboard that's again a relatively straightforward circuit and I must apologise yet again because um, 
the two smallest value capacitors on there are the physically the largest that's because they're high voltage ones um, in fact in the case of the the 33 uh, nanofarad it's 630 volts which is that great big chunky um, yellow thing top right um, they were of course uh, designed to replace components like that in um, in valve circuits where they'd need to deal with very high B plus voltages um, don't have that problem these days of course so yeah circuits fairly straightforward I think so you've got 33N is at the top the 10N is uh, next to the transistor you can see it says 10N upside down there and the inductor 3.3 microhenries is that uh, that greenish coloured uh, component that's just above the 10 nanofarad capacitor so fairly straightforward and the output uh, goes off to the right on that that purple coloured jumper so we'll probe that um, purple coloured jumper with the scope and uh, see what uh, the output of a Colpitz oscillator looks like so let's hop across to the bench and have a look Colpitz oscillator then here she is in all her glory uh, it is running, ticking away there. You can't uh, see anything, obviously. That's why um, these I could almost put a still on and you'd, uh, it'd get you the same effect. However, let's just look at a screen grab from there and you can see we've got um, quite a pleasant uh, sine wave coming out. Um, it does jiggle about a little bit, but again, we've got, you know, um, over a megahertz going on here and it's just laid out um, on the breadboard without uh, too much... Um, uh, too much care for, for layout and screening it etc so uh, hopefully you can see um, she's working away so that is uh, Colpitz oscillator with the two um, capacitors with the centre tap let's look now at the Hartley oscillator and um, it's very similar to the Colpitz oscillator we've still got that tank circuit in the collector of the uh, of the transistor and that's doing the if you like selection of the frequency that's used for feeding back and you can see the circuit goes there from the coil across the top to the emitter of the transistor uh, just for uh, reference the culpit circuit fragment above the collector there looked like so so you've got one coil two capacitors in the Hartley you've effectively got one capacitor and two coils although it's drawn there as one coil and there obviously would be mutual inductance uh, both variations will work actually as you'll uh, see in a moment so on the breadboard then um, yeah that's um, pretty similar uh, now I haven't got a, a tapped induct well I've got some tapped inductors but they were nowhere near the value I would need um, so I've made use of two discrete inductors which are the two components at the bottom there the two greenish components I've marked them up the one horizontal is the 6.8 microhenry and the one vertically is the one microhenry and I did have a bit of a play about with them because uh, obviously there will be some mutual inductance between those uh, two components but I've put them at right angles to try and minimize that uh, there was a little bit of difference in frequency when I put them side by side but I didn't think I'd bore you all to death with that so that certainly putting them at right angles does uh, minimize the um, effective mutual inductance which wouldn't be strong at that sort of distance anyway so uh, that's the general arrangement of the circuit I'm sure you can um, the rest of it will make sense to you um, with the, the transistor there at uh, the top but it's pretty much the same circuit except uh, for the the way the uh, um, resonant circuit above the collector is arranged so let's go and have a look at that on the bench here's the Hartley oscillator then uh, as you've just been uh, seeing there on the slides and we've got the um, two inductors here I've actually was tutting around and moved one of the inductors here to see if it made much difference which it doesn't um, it is running uh, so rather than just show you a a moving sine wave is a grab from the scope of the output and bear in mind you know we've got about one and a half megahertz here something like that so it's not surprising we haven't got perfect waveform just working on a, a breadboard without any shielding or anything like that and probably a few uh, less than ideal component um, connections but that's the that's the Hartley operation uh, Hartley oscillator operation uh, and as you can see it uh, does the job rather well Okay, well there you have um, LC oscillators. We looked at JFET, looked at the Colpits, and looked at the Hartley. 
um, and hopefully um, you've found it interesting. These are really straightforward circuits to build, so I'd encourage you to, to have a go, get the breadboard out and play. It's a, a really good way to learn electronics. I've enjoyed putting these circuits together. When I make a video, I quite often build the circuits and play with them and decide wh whether or not they're, they're worth doing. In the case of this video, I built about four or five circuits on the breadboard before I actually arrived at the three that you've seen today. So yeah, I'd encourage you, you, you obviously learn along the way. So thanks very much for watching. I'm expecting there'll be um, another, at least another one uh, videos on oscillators, maybe more. I better not um, trip myself up and say that uh, there'll just be one more because there might be a couple. Um, so hopefully uh, you'll be interested enough to want to come and watch that video too. Thanks very much for watching. See you on the next one.